we're going to be starting here in just a couple of minutes. So uh, we're uh, we're here. So thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Hopefully you get some great insight today, or at least some thoughts. The whole purpose of this really is just to get people thinking. You know, where am I going with this? <clears throat> Why did I work so hard to get where I am? Um, and, you know, the strategy uh, moving forward. So, hey, I see who hands uh, on. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I, I want to thank Equal Marketing for making this possible. Um, you guys have been amazing. Uh, they basically pitched this to me about, you know, they know that I love teaching and how can we do this and, and teach our uh, young doctors, entrepreneurs, business people, um, and do this uh, very efficiently. And now with podcasts, you can do that. And uh, so Hute was actually one of, one of the groups that I, uh, that I mentored. So what we're going to talk about today is, um, you know, the acquisition of wealth over time for physicians. And I'm going to talk about some of the pitfalls and why people uh, misfire here, misadventure. Uh, a couple topics coming up. Um, we're going to talk about how, you know, what are multiple profit centers and how do you develop them? Um, you know, how do you add physicians to your group? Um, how do you do an acquisition? You know, we've done, um, we're on our second acquisition now. So, uh, you know, how do you, what are the, the anatomy of an acquisition? Life work balance, I think is really important priorities. And then how do you structure or plan for an exit at some point in your career? So for those of you who don't know me, I, I've been a fellowship for director for over 20 years. I've been very involved with our academy. I love to teach and share what I've learned over the years um, so that other people don't make the same mistakes. And I don't think that physicians have uh, a great opportunity to learn uh, the business. Um, many of our colleagues are very secretive at the meetings. I, I hate to say it, but it's true, um, mainly because it's, you know, people don't want to talk about business. They want to talk about the clinical aspects. But uh, when you get into small groups, you can you can share an awful lot um, about, you know, what works, what doesn't work. So the first thing I want to touch on is, you know, what is, you know, what is a physician entrepreneur? I mean, what is an entrepreneur? You know, how is it different than a small business person? And I got to tell you, you know, nowadays, oh gosh, there's so many people out there trying to teach uh, the younger generation how to become entrepreneurs because it's a now a sexy name, right? I mean, we've had a good economy. Um, but I remember about 20 years ago, a physician orthopedic surgeon referred to me as an entrepreneur and I was offended. And I think that entrepreneur had a little bit of a negative connotation for years, right? I see Naren laughing there, but, but it's true. And what, you know, really what is a, you know, what is an entrepreneur? An entrepreneur is somebody who just takes, is, takes risk and tries to, make, to benefit from that. And what we see in aesthetic medicine um, is that we do tend to see fewer, more people who are entrepreneurial, people who are willing to go it on their own and take a chance and not just join the establishment. So that's, you know, and so anyone who is thinking about going it on their own, leaving the university, the first thing I tell them they've got to do is they've got to read the E-Myth uh, by Michael Gerber. Uh, and it's the E-Myth revisited and it's not the physician version. You don't want the institutional version you want because most of us that are going to go down this road are somewhat, they're, we're scrappers, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're going to try to scrap our way um, to um, making a living um, for our family. So, so that's kind of his intro introduction. And what I want to talk about today is the end in mind, you know, as, as Naren was saying earlier, you know, what began with the end in mind and, you know, why, why acquisition of wealth versus income? And I think part of it is because most physicians are not taught to, um, not taught to think about it, uh, not taught to think about it, but what most physicians, why are we different? You know, why are we different? The reason we're different is because we're trained differently. We go through a training program where um, it's almost taboo to talk about, you know, making money. It's almost ta ta taboo to discuss that. And 
in general, you know, physicians go through this and no one really talks to them about, you know, what is, you know, what is your goal when you get out? And most of us are just thinking income, right? I mean, Darren, you're in business for yourself, right? And so what is it different than most of the traditional physicians have? Well, the most tra traditional physician gets out in practice and they have 25 or 30 years of making X plus 5% for the next 30 years, right? You as a small businessman don't know if you're going to go belly up next year, but you know what I'm saying. Exactly. You know? And I think that's why the mindset is so different for physicians. They, you know, so what I'm going to come back around to here is the importance of thinking of, you know, net worth, you know, what is my net worth and how do I get there? Because what I found coaching physicians and guiding physicians that most of them, Focus on their income, and um, when you focus on your income, income just really translates into lifestyle if you're going to make that number for many, many years, and they don't think about the risk to their business, and that's very different. If you're going to go into aesthetic medicine, um, you, we may have a recession next year, right? I mean, I've been in practice 25 plus years, and I've seen three recessions. And, you know, the other thing is... Um Traditional medicine usually is paid for by a third party, the insurance yes. the government, right? So it's almost like a, it's almost like a, a privilege. It's, it's a, something that people just get taken care of. But when you get into aesthetic medicine, nobody's going to pay for it except the customer. Right. So it is business in the purest form. They can. It pay is. Anybody? Why should they pay that money to you? Absolutely. And it is, it is much more uh, a, a business than third party reimbursement medicine, which is basically, you know, and we can, we can talk about how the Affordable Care Act is going to affect this, but I'm, I don't want to go there. I'm because it is going to change. It is going to change what physicians have been traditionally experiencing for the last 40 years. Because most physicians, they get out, they make X, I don't care what that number is, 253, four, four, depending on and they can plan on making X plus a percentage of that next year. And so they really take no risk. And I'm, you know, we can, you know, I can tell you how the business people look at this. They, they look at, you know, physicians as not ever taking risk. Um, and we argue that because we say, yeah, well, we're working around blood every day. But the reality is if those of us work our rear ends off, get through medical school, get through residency, we can be pretty, pretty assured a pretty good lifestyle. And by the way, most people think we make way, way too much money. So, right. So what I want to touch on is I want to touch on net worth. What is net worth? And I'm going to, we're going to get back to this. What our goal should be really is to get to a point in our career where our net worth is growing at a rate greater than our income. And that's the point where you're free. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, a couple of years ago, I got rid of all of my disability. I cut my life. I got rid of my life insurance because I got to a point where my net worth was growing twi at twice my uh, reported income. That's where we want to get. We want to don't want to be focusing on our, um, you know, on our income per se. So I want to talk a little bit about money because this is something physicians never talk about. And I want to tell you my, you know, my truisms as I believe about money because it's and there's nothing wrong to talk about it but I went through a fellowship and I went through a residency it, god forbid you talk about like who's you know who gets paid what you know it's it's like it's like it's like taboo because we're so we're in this we're in this because we're altruistic doctors right so a couple things when I tell these same things to my kid first of all money's nothing more than dirty paper right and it's just a way to keep score in life and those and it doesn't, it doesn't give you happiness. You know this, right? It's just a way to keep score. Um, and no matter how much you have or make, don't think you're better than the next guy because somebody's got lots more, right? And so once you realize that, then you say, okay, it's just a way to keep score. And part of this keeping score is to determine each year, in my opinion, what your net worth is. Because this way, at least, See, if I'm going year to year to year and I'm just generating an income and providing for my family, um, 
I'm not really getting anywhere, am I? I mean, the other thing you mentioned is um, peace of mind comes when you are safe. When you have a network, if something bad happens, you said right now you give up all your disability insurance and all the other stuff. Because you know, it doesn't matter what happens, you're covered, your family is covered. And yeah. It doesn't come from being a physician or having a job or having a practice. No, the other thing that comes with that is the ability to take risk. And so many physicians are so, and I'm gonna talk about why physicians and physicians entrepreneurs are different than most small business people. Because if once you understand the mindset, I think it allows you to break, it allows you to break out from that. You know, um, most physicians really go, think about the training. They go to medical school, uh, financial, you know, sacrifices and just tons of delayed gratification and this mindset that someday I'm gonna make, let's use the number, 300, 200, whatever that number is, but once I'm there, I'm, I'm over the finish line, you know? I don't, and, and so part of it is going through residency and fellowship sets expectations to docs that I'm gonna make, quote, a lot of money, and um, so why make sacrifices now? Why live like the small businessman who doesn't know what the future is? And I'll tell you a couple of stories. I mean, I remember one of my colleagues in, you know, in medical or in residency, um, you know, we weren't making a lot of money back then, but, you know, went out and he bought himself a thousand dollar bicycle, you know. If he had to take that money out of a bank account somewhere versus just, you know, borrowed money, might have thought, thought about that more, but the reality was he's living beyond his means, you know, and I see, I see some of our residents now, they, they buy these strollers for their kids, you know, I remember back in the day when buying my daughter diapers, you know, we went to Walmart and she would, you know, she would pee and it'd run down her leg because I had the cheap, the cheap ones, you know, but, but residents will go out and buy these very expensive strollers because someday, someday I'm going to be making the big bucks. And so why, have go through that sacrifice right now. And I think that is one of the reasons why the, the, um, the mindset is different for the physician coming out. And I don't want to use the word entitlement because entitlement, I, it has such a negative connotation, but there are these expectations and, and entitlement things like I've gone through all this. I deserve to live better than that. So, you know, in my last year of my residency, I'm going to go out and buy that little BMW, damn it, you know? And I don't really care about what it costs right now because I, I've put all my time into my education. So that's one mindset different. The other is thinking about making a lifetime of income versus the small businessman who doesn't know what tomorrow is gonna bring, you know? And, until, and, and I like to give a lot of homework, so I'm gonna give you some homework. It, for those who haven't read The Millionaire Next Door, have you read that, Aaron? I haven't, I read the other one. Well, the Millionaire Next Door, and I don't want to tell the whole story, is about a woman who dies, who was a little, an IRS agent for many, 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 many years, had no one to leave her estate to, and lo and behold, they found out she was worth many millions of dollars. But, but a lot of the small business, and, and really what it comes down to, the wealth in this country is held in the hands of the small businessman. And the reason why is most small businessmen, who are successful, by the way, because 90% of small businesses fail, right? 50% of them fail in the first year. But the reason why is that the small businessman lives well within their means if they're successful. They live in a modest house. They don't overstate because they know tomorrow their business may be in trouble. They know they may have a recession coming. And so they live well within their means and they accumulate wow. assets and wealth. And they start investing that. And basically, that's one of the things I did. On a, you know, I moved back to the area. I, was, I bought an extremely modest house. that would basically, basically, my mortgage payment was as much or less than rent would be. I bought a used, I had a used car. I actually, my car was so bad that I had a fellowship. I left it in Chicago. I gave it away because it wasn't worth driving it back. But I grew up in a small family business where we were worried about, and man, my, my family, my dad has a fair amount of wealth now, but at the time we were taught these principles of living well within your means. And I think if you're gonna go down the road of 
becoming a physician entrepreneur, you need to think about those things because you're not going to get out and make, you know, two, I'm just using numbers, you know, 250 and guarantee, cause you may be, you know, you may make, you may make seven figures at some point if you're, if you're fortunate, you do things right. But, but that comes with sacrifice and ramen noodle soup, you know, uh, and you know, mac eating macaroni and cheese and living well within your means, which is a whole different mindset of what we're what we're used to. I mean, who do we train with? We train with these people live in big houses and all they have they have Mercedes and their wife has a Mercedes and and so we we are trained to feel like we and I don't want to use the word deserve, but so am I making sense there? And I I think it's a mindset thing that we need to teach. Yeah, I think um, I had a friend of mine who was a cardiologist, he came for dinner a few months ago and he said, like, when you're in medical school, they tell you to follow the rules. This is the way you're supposed to do it because otherwise you might kill someone. And then they also tell you, you are awesome. You know, you should have this and you should have that. All these advisors are coming and telling you, you know, you need to get a loan for this and loan for that and buy this and buy that. So it's kind of like a trap. On one hand, you are told risk is bad and all that stuff. And on the other hand, you're told, um, you know, you should have this quote unquote lifestyle on day one. And, and uh, so what you did, if I understood correctly, is you also have a lot of things today that, and you enjoy life and you have an amazing office, like what, 20,000 plus square feet. You just delay gratification. You just did it in reverse. So when you were young and you were creating net worth, you focused on that as opposed to spend it and then always be broke. Yeah, my, my dad used to say to me, my dad used to say to me, the first thing you need to do is to, is to pay yourself. And pay yourself doesn't mean pay yourself to spend. You know, it means take, I don't care, like even when I was a resident, even when I was a resident, whether it was a hundred bucks a week, I always put money away in that you never touch. Because I guess maybe I knew the direction I was going and I didn't know, I knew that I didn't want to work for someone. Um, but I think if, if it's important for physicians who are in aesthetic medicine or going down this road to at least understand why their trained mindset is different than the small business person. Like the other thing, for example, is I never bought anything. I bought a used car like you, but I never took a loan. I just paid cash. So if I can't, yeah. I won't buy it. I have no car loans right now, but I, you know, I have no car loans right now because I do the same thing. I, you know, I buy a car with 10,000 miles on it and I pay cash. Um, and, you know, but I'll be frivolous where I want to be. You know, if I want to fly private somewhere, I'll do that now. But, but cause I can, you know, I can afford that. But, but I went for many, many years, um, you know, living conservatively. And it doesn't mean going without or, you know, having to mix powdered milk for your kids for school, but it means, really living well within your means and starting to put, you know, and if physicians think about it and the, the business community looks at us, it, it, you know, first of all, they don't think that we ever can fail. You know, physicians don't fail. This is what you're told. They're never going to, you're never going to fail. This is, well, the reality is the, the landscape was littered with a lot of medical spas and physicians, actually uh, plastic surgery practices at the turn downturn of 2008. They were because they were over leveraged, because they you know they borrowed too much money, because they went out and bought you know instead of uh, really doing their due diligence on a piece of equipment, uh, they went to the you know to the big meeting and and by the way this piece of equipment just conveniently be happens to be priced around a hundred thousand bucks, and you can generate so much and by the way the guy down the street has a piece of equipment so you're starting to feel like geez I I, I got to I you know the f was it. FOMA, you're missing out, right? So, you know, there, and you were told that physicians don't fail. And yet you, ha you know, you haven't had a chance to talk to somebody who's, uh, you know, gone bankrupt. And I know some physicians that have, plastic surgeons that have gone bankrupt um, in the downturn of the market. So that scares, that scared the hell out of me. Um, so some of it's our training, some of it's in, inherent, but in reality, if you think about it, this, in fact, I know this because I've talked to my business buddies. Um, they look at us, first of all, many of us are, are very risk averse. That's why we went into medicine, right? If I put in all this hard work and turn the crank, I'm going to come out and I'm going to make this very good living. If, 
we really believed in ourselves in risk, many of us might not have gone down the road of medicine. We like the fact that there's some security of making something for 30 years. And that's very different than, right? You know, we have friends at bankrupt companies and you know, that stuff all takes its toll on us. So physician practices can fail. And the most, there's two most, the two most common reasons for a business to fail are what, Naren? Uh, running out of cash, cash flow. Number one is, is uh, not having capital. Right, running out, of, running out of capital. And the second is inexperience. And you know, this goes back to the E myth. Uh, if you read, if you read the story, but here's the thing, and this is why physicians. I, and again, this is why this this podcast is really geared toward physicians. Physicians are very different because they have gone through different mindset. Right, they go through all of this education and training, 13, 12, 15 years fellowship, whatever, and you get out. And you're not experienced in running a small business, no. Nope. But you think to yourself, first of all, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to get in. I'm not going to go get an MBA because I, I've got all this education now, right? And second of all, how hard could it be? You know, I'm a smart doctor, right? How hard could it be to run a business? In reality, it's the hardest thing that I do. More difficult to run a successful business, right? I mean, and the, the bigger you get as you know, and your operating expenses go up, the more you have to pay very close attention to what's going on. So, so physicians, you know, and I went through a period of time where I, I got accepted to an executive MBA program. And, but the difference, because I decided, I, I decided not to go down the road, the difference between where I was at at that point and what a lot of physicians are at is I was, I was a consummate reader of business. I mean, I'm a science guy. So I thought to myself, well, there's got to be some data out there. There's got to be some, and that's why I fell in love with Jim Collins and all of his work, you know, good to great, great by choice, because he had data on publicly traded companies and made a lot. And once I started to really do this on a very regular basis and read all the time, I realized that this was something, I started to see the same themes repeat themselves and I started to gain clarity. So the set, first thing I want to mention is, you know, we need to start thinking about break, changing our mindset if we're going to run a business because you have no business just being like most physicians. And the second thing is become a student of business. Really try to take it seriously. Uh, you know, listen to, I mean, I've listened to tapes on, you know, uh, on, you know uh, what do you call it? audio books on accounting and those kind of things. It's a different mindset, right? Audible, for example, is a place where you can like pay a subscription fee and you know listen to any book pretty much. Yeah, I mean nowadays you can, you know, especially with the amount of time people spend in cars. Yeah. There's almost no reason to just listen to the radio. So I think that you know again that the, the challenge we have with a lot of docs is our mindset is very different. We need to change that. We to to the point that we want to be you know, live a more conservative lifestyle. For example, the car you drive, just like what you and I are talking about, you know. And if you think about it, it, actually, if you, I've got teenage and adult kids now, right? So if I'm driving a brand new car, you know, brand new, brand new $70,000 car, my wife, then my wife, of course, is going to want to drive a brand new $70,000 car. And then what do my kids expect? Because they're going to private schools with all these other kids. So I think the physicians also had these expectations imposed on them by you know, their friends and who's successful. And most of the time, you, I don't want to say we use the word impress, but they feel the obligation to keep up with the Joneses. And by the way, most of the Joneses you can't stand anyway. So, I mean, why are you trying to keep up with the jerk next door, you know, I mean, discipline is freedom. And so that's why I chose to talk about this in the very first, one of the very first podcasts, because this, you got to get this stuff right before you start moving on to buying another, buying a surgery center. You agree? Yeah, absolutely. So I want to talk about a little tool. So this is like yeah. the basics, right? The first things first. So this is the basics. To summarize what I got so far. One yeah. Is, uh, don't think how much money you make every year. Think what's your net worth. Yes. Got it? So you're really, your mind is going to shift 
sort of totally focused on what can I do to increase my net worth as yes. well as my income on paper. Yes. I know a doctor very successful in New York City, but when you did all the math, I one day sat down with him and did all the math, he's making like 30 bucks an hour after he pays for the rent and pays for the employees and he looks at all the hours he puts in. But on paper, he's making millions. I mean, yes. just pretty, you know, bad. It's all on mortgages and loans and paying the bank and you name it. Yeah, not how much you make, it's how much you, how much you, not only how much you save, not how much you make, but it's how much, how that accrues over time. And so anyone who has significant net worth thinks of the tax consequences of all their decisions. So when you're buying a personal something, you're paying for that with after-tax dollars. And so consumer spending is so expensive. And what I'm hearing, what I'm hoping people also get from this is, I mean, you are a very successful doctor, you know, one of the top doctors. Um, it's okay not to keep up with the Joneses. It's okay not to keep up with, quote unquote, every other doctor and they are Benz and they are Tesla and Tesla nowadays. I guess in the old days it was the Benz, but now it's Tesla. <laughs> you know, it, it's a Tesla, okay, yeah, a Tesla. Not keep up with the Joneses. It's okay to, um, you know, you know, especially in the early days, be really careful about the money. Whether it's not only in your personal life, but even in your business life, you know, buying that equipment that the guy, you know, the my competition across the street has. So, yeah. It's actually quite liberating, to be honest. You know, it's very liberating to know. And then when you get to a point where you have, uh, you have what you need to decide, you can afford to take more risk, which allows you, okay, to win more. Let me ask you, what do you mean by liberating? Is it because otherwise you're paying, you're working for the bank for the first 10 days or five days of your month? Is that what you mean by liberating? Yeah. So when you have, when you have, you, it's very risky to take risk when you're overextended. All right. Okay. You know, when you are using your, your cash and you're not borrowing to take risk, um, you know, if, not that you want to lose, but if you lose, you know, you lose a hundred thousand dollars, you're not, you're not losing sleep over it. And um, the other thing about that is you become a better and more prudent risk taker. When you're, when you're spending borrowed money on a laser, you're not as, you're not as prudent in doing your due diligence. You think you know, as opposed to oh, hundred thousand dollars, how do I make hundred thousand dollars? A hundred doesn't sound like sound like a lot of money when it's not coming out of your bank account, right. you know, when it's on paper. So I, I want to, one of the things I want to spend a few minutes on here is talking about what do I mean by a net worth statement? Because I think that's, I had started doing it maybe 12 or 13 years, 12 years into practice. I wish I had done that from the very beginning. And so I, I, I want to teach everyone how, you know, so here's, I, I don't, and I apologize if this is common sense for most, for a lot of people, but it isn't common sense because I don't know many, many people that do this. Um, so what you do is at the end of every, and actually is I've gotten bigger and bigger and bigger with our business. Um, the bank requires this every year from me. You know? It also is what gives you leverage with the bank because what they, they see what your assets and your liabilities are. So you can get it from any bank, get it from your bank, tell them you, you know, you, could you have a blank financial statement? And in your blank financial statement, you will, and I'm gonna really boil it down to just basics here because that's all, but the, the details there, you put all of your assets, you list them all. Real estate, you know, um, you, know you're, you, you do a, an accurate business evaluation based on a multiple of earning, you know, so EBITDA. You, you do, and you do this for every single thing, every single asset that you own. And then you fill out all your liabilities. You know, what, what is owed? If I have a piece of land that's a uh, half a million bucks and I owe a hundred on it, that hundred's listed in the liability. And you do it for your, you do it for your personal stuff too. Now I wouldn't put in there, you know, I, I got a $30,000 tractor, you know, but I mean, pretty much all of those real assets you list things that you could actually sell tomorrow or 
sell within a reasonable uh, time frame. And then what you do is you've got your net worth. And your net worth is you take all your assets that you own and you subtract all of your liabilities. And that number, you know, if you have 3 million and 1 million, it's 2 million is your net worth. And what I think is very important to do is to actually graph this. And that's what I do every year. I look at how my net worth has gone up. And the other thing is it really, it really, um, it's hard to ignore if you have debt there. And I, I actually, debt makes me very nervous. So I try to um, have my, uh, you know, asset to debt ratio well over 10 to one. And, and ideally I like it somewhere around, you know, 15 to 20 to one. I don't like to have a lot of debt. And if I look at where my, you know, I have a small, I mean, all of the debt we have, very little debt in our business. And uh, I have a little bit, of, you know, a few hundred thousand bucks left on our building. And I got a little bit more than my home and uh, a couple other uh, real estate ventures that we have. But, but by and large, that's what gives you clarity as to where you stand. Um, it also is what makes you be able to pick up the phone when, the, when you're providing this to them. And I do it every single year and I graft it out, and I have a file where I keep it all in, but it allows you to see where you're going. And then all of a sudden, just like the big snowball rolling down the hill, it starts to gain momentum, right? And, but the, why is that so important? You know, why is it so important? And, and I gotta tell you, the, and, and, and in all fairness to the, the bankers, and in all fairness to the insurance people, and the financial advisors, okay, unless you got a, true, a financial advisor that is truly just getting paid by the hour, most of them are not really your friend because they have their agenda. You know, they're trying to, whether they're trying to sell you more insurance or trying to, you know, they're, they're, they're making 1% off all your assets. Um, they're not going to give you the real clear picture because you know, here's, here's and this, this comes, if you read the millionaire next door, it hits you. What do you need to retire on? I think you have to ask yourself that. And I, I mentor, I had this conversation with my fellows when they first start. I said, what do you think you need to retire on? What do you need to live on? Is it 200, 300, 500? Well, if you're really conservative and you listen to the financial people, they say you should, you live on, you can live on about 4% or 5% of what your net is. So, so if you need, you know, if you need a half a million bucks, to live on, you need 10 million put away. Okay, if you want to live on 200,000, you need 5 million put away. These are just rough numbers, right? Well, here's the problem with most physicians, and especially those that go down the road of trying to you know, develop their own business. Well, if you're living a higher lifestyle, you're putting less away. So it's this big slippery slope because now you're putting less away, so you're living on a half a million bucks, you're never going to reach that 10 million because you're not putting enough away. And I don't know about you, but to me, the end game is not to get into retirement and contract my lifestyle. I'm just, why not just get ready to die? Right? Is what I'm saying making sense, Naren? Yeah, it absolutely makes sense. I think the other thing, um, it's interesting, I know you talk about this. Businessman usually can sell the business if he does it right. A lot of it, yes, that's another, yeah. A lot of physicians don't do it right, so they can't really sell it. Yeah. You know? Why don't they do it right? I mean, I'll tell you why I think they don't do it right. Why don't they do it right? <laughs> well, first of all, um, most plastic surgery practices there's, 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 there's sorry, multi-dimensional. Um, most plastic surgery practices are too dependent on one doctor. Okay, you're a businessman, you're private equity money, you're not interested in that. What if that guy, you know, with most physicians who are, who are starting and growing their practice, they're more focused on their revenue and the number of cases they're doing than, than building a business they can sell. And then I've seen the biggest, the biggest failures I've seen with um, physicians bringing on other docs. And we've been very successful at this, is that the senior doc 
they, they, you know, they want to bring someone on to give them more freedom and, and to not work as hard, right? But they still don't want to give up the income. <laughs> so, you know, they start, if you're truly trying to set your business up to sell, there has to be, there has to be, uh, yeah, but there's got to be a net at the end of it, right? That there's a multiple. And what are the, my experience from colleagues of mine that approach me at the meetings and say, hey, you know, I, I know you've done all this stuff. Can, you know, would you mind giving me some guidance? They're, you know, they're 65 years old or even, I mean, even 55. You need to start thinking about this well in advance. How are you going to pull your equity out? Because a business, and actually a lot of small businesses, businessmen and women are guilty of this too. They assume their business is worth more than it is. Right? And they hang on. They hang on way too long. But I think, I think that physicians and plastic surgeons are, um, have, are uniquely in an area of um, disadvantage because a lot of the revenue, at least the way most practices are structured, is, um, is developed by one rainmaker. And that's not, they've just created a job for themselves. It's not really a business. And as you know, a job is not saleable, you know. And the other difference I notice between successful doctors that I work with, I work with 200 plus, you know, doctors versus the not so successful. The successful ones, the ones who think as entrepreneurs are creating uh, opportunities and value for multiple parties. They're creating opportunities and value for their employees. So employees are motivated to work hard because there's something that they get from it. Yes. They create opportunity value for even their clients who now go and tell their friends about you know, how great this practice is and, and really become their champions. So it's very different, right? Like, I mean, I, I remember you talked about, um, you know, the ER doctor, right? You know, the one man show, like you are like doing everything versus here you are a behind the scenes person, you make other people better, you, you create opportunities and value for others. And maybe not everyone makes that transition from you know, the one man show and everybody says me to, you know, I'm just making everyone else, you know, creating value for others. Yeah, um, you know, said a different way, it's, it's creating a culture of winning and accountability for everybody. And it is, again, I, I'm not beating up on, on docs here. I, 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 we're just trying to shed some insight, but this is why I think that a lot of, we're trained differently. We're, we're trained to depend on ourselves. You know, we're, we're trained to build everything around ourselves. And what, what the business people will tell you, that's one of the reasons why private equity is not as interested in those practices. It has one big name in it. Um, they want to see a plug and play. They want to see that that if William stepped away from that business, other than maybe management or leadership, that business would still continue to grow and make money. Um, that's why private equity has been interested in primarily dermatology practices and primarily uh, ophthalmology because they, they they can plug and play. Um, one of the things that I work very hard on and I got a lot of guidance and coaching and, and, and we are set up that way is I could walk away from this tomorrow and, and we could easily bring someone in to fill my shoes because it's not so the way we have it all set up now, it is not all dependent on, you know, Ed Williams. Part of that is also uh, a mindset of me, um, not having my ego get in the way and wanting the business crash and burn off my lead. But if, if we're smart enough, we think about it, where we're really creating value, where we're going to benefit, benefit on the exit is if we do it right and we create it where it's not so dependent on, on me. And it just, it puts us at a disadvantage that, that most of us don't really think about until it's too late. You know, I always knew I had to create a value. I wanted to create something that was saleable. Now I understand why you want people to read that book, E-Myth. Yeah, when you read, again, if you've read the E-Myth, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's at a much smaller scale. You know, Sarah made all these cookies, and one day she realized that, you know, she was the cook, bottle washer, and everything else, you know, cleaning the toilets. And, um, you know, when, when she realized she had this epiphany, you know, how do I, you know, back to the, the business world uses, 
how can I possibly scale up my operation? Because you're never, there's only so many hours in a day for a practicing surgeon. That's performance, right? How do I leverage myself? I have to leverage myself by scaling operations. And scaling operations, which is now become, makes your business become more valuable, does not depend on one person. Right? I mean, listen, I know you have these thoughts all the time. How do I scale up what I'm doing? So that Naren doesn't have to sit here and talk to every single person. But you know what I'm saying? I mean, for you to be able to grow your business, you have got to, to create a culture of winning and accountability, and you've got to be able to scale what you have so it's not dependent on you. But, and again, the, the beginning with the end in mind is, it, it, what is the end game? It's to exit at some point. You know, there's a, a woman who ran Adirondack Beverage that eventually got sold to Saratoga Water, which is big now, right? And I remember reading her quote 20 years ago, and it's very hard for physicians to live this mindset. And it was this. Someone asked her what was the best thing, advice you could give to the small business person. And she said never fall in love with your business okay because it's there it's there to sell and it, it you know this is why i think it makes it so difficult for those of us who are physician entrepreneurs because that's not the way we're trained our everything our ego our everything is tied up in who we are and our practice and our business and if you're smart about it you should be doing just the opposite you should be yeah, you want to be the you want to be the name and the for your patients, but as uh, for as far as the business go, you want to devalue who you are. Does that make sense? Yes. Right. So another CEO can come in and you know do what you're doing and take over your business. Now it's got value. Anyway, so that's kind of you know why I think it's important to, to do net worth statements. Um, because uh, again, getting back to that is, is you do that, you do it on a daily, on a yearly basis. Here's the other thing is you may have a year that's a recession year. And for, for those of uh, those who have not been through recessions before, um, you know, they, they're painful. Um, when you run a small business, you got a lot of employees, right? I mean, I, I think there, there, I don't think there's a small business person that's not thinking about that right now, right? I think the stock market's overvalued. You know, statistically, we see one every seven years. I saw one in 95. I saw one in 2001 and 2008. You tell me if we're overdue. So, you, you know, the, the beauty of doing a financial statement is that's really, remember I told you from the beginning, what is money? Money is just a way to keep score. But that is one way to keep score. Because when we went from 2000, even though 2008, you know, um, in a recession year, as long you, you're continuing to look at your net worth, and as long as your net worth, I mean, maybe if you got a lot of money in the stock market, then that's going to that's gonna take a hit. But it allows you to really see, it also allowed me to see really how we rebounded after, you know, the market. Because that should be where, you know, all decisions made, you know, thinking about what are the tax consequences of this decision. That's the same thing. And by the way, all personal finance, you know, physicians, it, it's all right in the, the email or the, the millionaire next door. Physicians go out and buy these big houses, right? Because they're told that, you know, it's the biggest asset you have. The reality is that's part of your lifestyle and that's still expensive. You know, you've got, you get a big house, you got a big tax bill, you got a big tax bill, you got, a, you know, you got the maintenance guys. And, you know, I unfortunately, uh, you know, I've let my guard down. I've become soft as I've gotten older. Um, but taking into consideration the tax consequence of every purchase is very important. And then, you know, filling out your net worth statement and, and doing that on a religious, religious basis. And what I do is graft it, like I said, graft it out, graft out what your net worth is. And when you see it growing, you know, you may have had a tough year for whatever reason, you, you, you know, whether it's, you know, financially or personally or whatever, but as you see that net worth growing, it gives you, because right now, one of the things we're seeing with a lot of physicians is just burnout. Um, anyway, um, any other thoughts? I mean, one of the things I want to talk about in the next session a little bit is developing multiple profit centers. That's, that's a, a question I get all the time. People shooting me an email out. I know you added this. I know you added this, you know, there are downsides to having profit centers too, because as I say to my staff, you know, some of them can be profit less centers, right? And they just need a distraction. 
by the way, if any of you have any questions, you can raise your hands or you can enter your questions in the chat and I'll read Dr. Williams. Yeah, I think one of the things we'll try to do is um, take questions and we'll try to answer them, you know, somewhere maybe in the, in the context of what we talk about next time, but, uh, or, you know, what we're, what we're doing now. And then as a theme for life in general, when you're running a small business, um, I don't know what success is, but I know that the hurdle before success is complacency. Every time I let my guard down, um, I wish I hadn't. And I can, you know, we had some, our surgery center this year, uh, we had some change in turnover and accounting. So I wasn't looking at my uh, P&L, profit loss and balance sheet every single month. And all of a sudden I'm seeing the balance go down in the checkbook, you know, and we got into a situation where we got over the finish line and, you know, we broke even, but uh, that is not a good situation to be in when you got a lot of money going through there. So it's scary, but that's complacency. And I got to tell you, every single time I become complacent. Um, and so for those who are thinking about jumping out of the institution and going out on their own, um, again, most common reasons businesses fail, lack of capital, lack of experience, read, become a, a consummate learner in the area of business, and then don't ever, ever become complacent. Um, I remember one of my senior colleagues, I was in a winter meeting and, and he said to me, hey, Ed, you know, this is, I was in practice 10 years, he was in practice 20 years. He said, hey, what are you, what are you doing for marketing this year? And I said to him, I can't believe you're like, asking me. And he said, Ed, you never become complacent. So um, that's the, the, the most, you know, one of the most important things too. Don't become complacent. So what else? I saw you asked me a question there, Naren. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, you one of the topics here was mindset. Yes. A lot of, I mean, I, I talked to lots of doctors. Almost everyone gets, gets into medicine because they want to make a difference for others, right? Yes. Because of the system and all that stuff. So now let's say you create your aesthetic practice or growing your aesthetic practice. You have control. You can create whatever you want to create. What mindset would you recommend that such a doctor come in with? Um, I mean, for example, uh, you can still provide awesome, I mean, amazing results, value for your clients, right? Because it's your practice. Yeah. You can still make money. So I don't know. What are your thoughts? Like, well, what, is it well no, I, I, I think you're, you're, you're right. I mean, you, you know, there, um, you're, you're talking about altruism and giving and... Um, what is the ideal mindset for a doctor? Like, you know, a successful financially plus... Uh, emotionally success, successful doctor. The, the, well, first of all, I don't think you want to, most people go into medicine because they do want to make a difference, right? They go into medicine, they like helping other people. Um, however, it is important, as I tell our uh, fellows that come through, you know, if you, don't, if you don't become a student of your finances and a student of your money, you'll never have it. You'll just be, you know, so it, it doesn't, it's not, there's nothing wrong with saying, I want to be as a, a, you know, a business person too. And I want to, because I have 75 people that have, feed their families, you know, and I went for many, many years, you know, we did, I mean, I did physically did a lot of the trauma at the university. Um, I gave and gave, I ran clinics that I didn't get paid for. And I'm okay with that. I mean, I think, and so as of the last few years, I mean, I last year, a couple of years ago, and I don't want to get into political discussion, but what I finally had had it with the system, you know, and what the Affordable Care Act has done to physicians, by the way, physicians got screwed big time on this thing and they don't even realize it. Um, but I, I thought to my, I, it's terrible because we as physicians tend to be decent people, right? I almost felt guilty for walking away from, you know, providing to the insurance based patients in our area. I said, you know, I, I, I had always been very loyal to my community and being able to take care of these people. Well, first thing is, we, you know, one of our, our junior folks still is able to do, does that, still provides for insurance. But I changed my mindset and I said, you know, I have people who have been with me. I have someone who's been with me for almost since the beginning of my practice. I've got several people who have been with me more than 10 years. And I have a lot of people that come to work and have a great place to work. And I am 
you know, I'm creating a lot of value for them there. I don't have to feel guilty over the fact that I'm, that I'm focusing primarily on aesthetic medicine. And I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, we tend to be altruistic, but, but I think also doctors sometimes tend to be altruistic to a fault. You know, there's nothing wrong with us. You don't, you know, you don't uh, begrudge your buddy who's in private equity who is cashed out, right? Who, or, or, or friends of mine who've sold their business, who've sold three businesses and have done well. Well, why should we feel guilty about that as physicians? You know, like I said, I've got 75 people, you know, when you take in, you know, our anesthesia providers, our doctors, our maintenance people, you know, I have very little turnover and we, if we are successful in creating a, a culture of winning and accountability where people are going, you know what, I've never been taken care of this well and my family is doing better. Why should we feel guilty about that? So I don't know if I answered your question, but. Because I think people either, they didn't make any money from some maybe it's evil. I don't know. Maybe it's just some. Well, I, no, I think you're right. I mean, you know, we're, as I told you, it goes back to our training. You know, God forbid you talk about, you know, what you make as a physician, right? I mean, that's like, it's like taboo to like actually feel like you're getting paid to take care of people. That's why I think a lot of docs don't even want to talk about it. But if you don't become a student of, again, your, and I don't, one of the things you'll find in the millionaire next door is it's not how much you make. You know, it's not how much you make. It's, it's how much you accumulate over time. And, and you, I don't care if the number is one or two or three or four or 500 or a million bucks a year, the people who end up, and that's, that's the other thing is this woman who was the IRS agent who ended up, she just left him, left him, you know, uh, a modest lifestyle. And there have been, there's studies and data right now to support this, but people become happier as their income goes up until about $80,000. Okay. So if you're making a half a million bucks, you're making 200,000. There is no data to show that the guy making a half a million bucks is happier. And that's why I started at the very beginning by saying that money does not make you happy. I know, and here's, a, here's another truism, Ed Williams truism. I mean, if you focus on money and you're driven, you will have it. I, I really believe that. But if that is your priority in life, there are going to be a lot of other things that get left behind. You know, I know a lot of my friends and colleagues who, you know, wake up and they are very successful financially. And, and this, this isn't a cop out. Like you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't try to become a successful business person and have money. But I know a lot of people that have money and their priorities are screwed up and they're miserable. So, but why shouldn't you at least take a scientific approach to accumulating as much as you possibly can, given the fact, the sacrifice that you made going through medical school and residency and in fellowship? Because as I mentioned from the beginning, don't bank, don't count on the bankers or in the insurance people um, or the investment people to be helping out because they, you know, they have their agenda and, and that's a, another whole conversation. I can, I can talk specifically about banking, you know, if you want at some point, but um, there, there are a lot of mistakes and a lot of lessons I've learned from banking. Um, so you have to take charge of this yourself, I believe, as a physician. And we're running out of time here. Anything else you want me to touch on? I mean, Naren, I mean, I, I think next month we're going to talk more about profit. You know, what are the, what is a profit center? How do we develop profit centers? What are the pitfalls? Um, you know, how not to lose a ton of money on a profit center? Because I've done that. I think that would be a very interesting conversation because most doctors I know they don't look at their business. You know, what you're talking about is having multiple business within a business. Potentially. Potentially, that doesn't that isn't for everyone, by the way. Because you come become complacent with one of them, you're going to lose money. You know, not every, and if you don't have the stomach for it, because you have to invest in it, you have to be patient. A lot of people don't have the stomach for it. You know, a lot of people, and I, I go back to you know, and, and I think physicians too can fit into this category because um, one of my former fellows said to me. 
Dr. Williams know, he said, um, you know, money doesn't mean everything to me. He says, but I, there's no question I, I went down this road to make, to make a good living. He says, I grew up in a house where my dad and mom were stressed and all they talked about is what we didn't have and the money. And so, uh, you know, he, he went down that road to become free, as I mentioned in the beginning. And if that's your mindset, you maybe you're better off not, uh, you know, putting $200,000 on the line to start another business. Cause if that goes away, you're going to lose sleep over it. So, so next month, um, we're going to talk about, you know, developing profit centers. What's involved with that? We have uh, a lot of uh, different topics, as I mentioned before, that we're going to cover in the future. Um, you know, how to open a surgery center, you know, 20 year uh, insight that I've had running a surgery center, um, you know, how to add physicians to your group, how to devalue yourself so that you have a business that's worth more. Um, doing acquisitions, life work balance, I think is really, really important because physicians tend to feel guilty when they take time off. Um, and how do you set your exit up? So I really want to thank uh, Equal Marketing for uh, allowing us to host this podcast and all your contribution, uh, Naren. Any other things uh, that you want to touch on as we wrap this up? I want to thank you, Doctor, for doing what you do because I know of all the things you do, financially speaking, this is probably you know like you do it for free. Nobody pays for any of this stuff. So I mean, so I, I mean. There's no reason for you to do what you do, but you choose to do it. So I well, there, is, there is one. Okay. I, I want to, I have a daughter that's, uh, that's a, an op, is going down the road of ophthalmology and I want to be able to look our young generation in the eye and tell them they made, a right, they made the right decision. And as far as, you know, what you're talking about altruism and why we went into medicine and mission, you know, because we do go down the road to help people. I get, a, I get a lot more out of giving in this capacity um, than I do sewing up someone in the emergency room that doesn't say thank you anymore. So, you know, uh, this to me is, is actually a lot of fun. So I appreciate you guys host, appreciate you guys hosting it. All right. So until next time. All right, guys, we'll see you. Thanks, Naren. I'll talk to you next month. All right.